Welcome, Abby Sachs, um, to this interview as part of the International Conference on Shaping and Interpreting Transformative Constitutions. Um, yesterday, as part of the conference, we had a screening of your new movie, The Soft Vengeance. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about that. Well, the title's a bit odd, uh, but the idea was to capture my feeling when I got a letter when I was recovering from the bomb that blew me up placed by South African agents, I lost an arm, sight of an eye, and somebody wrote to me and said, don't worry, Comrade Albie, we will avenge you. And I thought, avenge me? We're going to cut off the arms, we're going to blind the people who did this, is that what we're fighting for? If we get freedom, if we get the rule of law, if we get justice in South Africa, that will be my soft vengeance. Roses and lilies will grow out of my arm. So that became the title that was used by Abby Ginsburg, who made a film of my life which included scenes of the bombing, just by pure chance somebody was there with a camera and they picked up the scenes immediately afterwards. My recovery, returning to South Africa, helping to write the new constitution, being on, on the constitutional court. Um, let's talk about your time in the Constitutional Court. You're known for giving very um, landmark decisions. And one of those decisions is in the case of Fouri. And we're here in Kenya grappling with constitutional in interpretation, especially when it comes to protection of minority groups. What are your experiences in terms of value clarification, um, especially when the public opinion is prejudiced and how, do, how does the court actually deal with that in competing interests? The very first case we had dealt with capital punishment and the great majority of South Africans wanted to keep capital punishment. I, I'd say a higher percentage of whites in fact wanted capital punishment than black people but there was a majority in favour of it. We had 400 people on death row and the court, the very first case we had, we decided unanimously capital punishment when the state cold-bloodedly takes the life of a fellow human being, reduces respect for life. It's the state, one of my colleagues put it, doesn't punish the crime, it repeats the crime. Mm -hmm. And so we unanimously voted against capital punishment, even although there might have been a majority in favour of it. The idea was to defend fundamental rights, particularly of minorities who are, might be unpopular in broad public mind, there's an intense form of human dignity and respect for human dignity that's involved and the state should not become a killer. So that, that set an example of the court doing its job under the constitution and not reading opinion polls. We don't stand for election. Uh, elections are based on who the public wants, but judges don't simply try to do what the public wants. Judges do pay, pay huge regard to the feelings of the public but at the same time, the role is a very specific one. Fourie dealt with same-sex marriages. And again, probably a majority of South Africans, for religious or other reasons, are against the public recognition of relationships of that kind. We had gay and lesbian people fought for our freedom in South Africa. They were in the resistance, went to jail. Some were killed in the course of the struggle, I'm quite sure. And they were saying, when we get freedom afterwards, Will we be free or will just the nation be free in a general way? And we just want a chance to express our intimacy and our love and affection for each other. If marriage is a good thing for heterosexual people, then surely marriage is a good thing for those of us who happen to be sexually attracted, erotically attracted to people of, of the same gender. And our court again unanimously decided that the common law in South Africa and the statute based on it uh, that said marriage is the union between one man and one woman uh, for life was inconsistent with our constitution, not to stop one man from marrying one woman, that, that part remained, but it was under-inclusive. It made invisible, it, it rendered out of contemplation even of the law the fact that there are people, maybe 10% of the population, happen to be attracted to the same gender and wanted the same chance to express their love uh, and to accept the responsibilities that heterosexual couples have. Uh, and I might say that these marriages now uh, are being celebrated uh, in the state sector quite routinely in South Africa. No walls have come tumbling down. Uh, and somehow there's a greater respect for diversity in our country. That's just the way 
many people happen to be, they have the right uh, to be who they are. At the same time, the judgment was very strong on saying, don't say that people who are opposed to recognizing homosexual relationships are bigots. That's just the way they see the world. And particularly members of faith communities cannot be compelled to celebrate marriages that go against the tenets of their religion. The same constitution that protects the rights, fundamental rights of same-sex couples to marry, protects the rights of faith communities not to be compelled to celebrate those marriages if it's against their religions. What we need is a coexistence in the one country of different worldviews, not one worldview conquering the other and forcing the other to submit. The other issue that we're grappling with in, in the Kenyan context is the, the strain, if it were, between the different arms of government when it comes to constitutional um, implementation. Um, when courts give judgments and orders against um, the, the legislature or the executive, they're either not followed or not followed to the letter. What is um, your experience um, in the South African context and what can we borrow in terms of good practice for our current situation? This issue cropped up right at the beginning in the very first year, a six-month-old court who'd been, uh, who'd been sworn in in front of Nelson Mandela and who stood up and said, the last time I got to my feet in court was to find out if I was going to be hanged. Today I rise to inaugurate South Africa's first constitutional court. An amazing moment. We all loved Mandela, uh, whatever our backgrounds might have been. And six months later, to show our gratitude, and I'm saying this a little bit ironically, we struck down two important proclamations issued by Mandela, very progressive ones. The content was good, first democratic local government elections, but he had been asked by Parliament to adopt these proclamations, and we said Parliament had to do the job itself. It could not entrust lawmaking authority to the president. We struck it down, and he accepted it completely. And he went on to television and said, I, as president, must be the first to accept the decision of the court as interpreted, uh, uh, interpreting the Constitution. And that set the paradigm for South Africa now. And successive presidents, whether they're happy with the decisions or not, uh, have all accepted the decisions of our court. Uh, sometimes there's reluctance on the part of the government, but I don't know of any case where there's been an absolute refusal of government officials uh, to, to follow through with the decisions of our court. At the same time, we don't feel we're issuing instructions to government. Uh, we are in dialogue with government, uh, with the legislature. And uh, when it comes to laws that are struck down as inconsistent with the Constitution, we suspend frequently the inconstitutionality uh, decision to give Parliament a chance to rectify the defect. And we listen to them. We say, tell us how much time do you need, uh, what would be reasonable, so that you can bring the legislation in line with the Constitution. We try to keep a very civil relationship, a sort of conversation uh, between the different branches of government. I'll ask you a little bit about the vetting process of the judiciary, um, because you have been involved with that in, in, in the Kenyan context. Do you think that it is a sufficient measure to regain public confidence in the judiciary? Um, and what are your comments on the public participation element? Because there are few people who feel that the deliberations of the vetting committee should be made public. Um, we should understand why you have reached the decisions that you have reached. Um, so what are your comments on that? Okay, I'm going to vet myself. <laughs> yeah. and, and the only thing I'm going to comment on is I think all of us would have preferred on the vetting board, I was 15 months on serving on the board, very extraordinary, uh, unique uh, Kenyan uh, process uh, that I, um, I learned an enormous amount participating in it. But I'll just say that I think all of us on the board would have preferred the hearings in public. Mm -hmm. The judges asked for the hearings to be in private and the legislature decided that they laid down that rule that the hearings are in private unless the judge expressly indicates that he or she would like it to be in public. I know of two judges who did have the hearings in public. I didn't feel they were any different in any way from those that were held in private. So it wasn't a decision of the board. It was the decision of the legislature at the request of the judges. 
And do you think the fact that it wasn't in public um, is hindering um, the confidence I'm not element? I'm at all. <laughs> I'm not commenting at all. I'm, I'm okay. now defunct. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm extinct, mm -hmm. but uh, um, I'm, I'm off the board now. I have been for some time, and, and the board will speak for itself. So.